All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the PetroTeach webinar on exploration, valuation, and decision analysis. I am Hassan Karimoyi and present PetroTeach today and act as facilitator in today's webinar. Let's wait for uh, two, three minutes. Some of the students are joining us. Uh, we will wait for two minutes. Okay, let's continue. Um, as you already heard from organizer, you are entering as listening only mode and muted. Before we proceed the event, let us check if you receive my voice. There is a window in front of you and by clicking on the arrow, you will see the full window version with a chat box. Please type the word hi or hello or something to make sure that we have established the full communication. Okay. Yes. I think you can hear me. Seems that everything is okay. Okay, agenda for a two-day webinar begins with a brief introduction to PetroTeach. Then we introduce our instructor, Dr. Babak Jafarizadeh, followed by some information about the course agenda on the exploration, valuation, and decision analysis by PetroTeach on coming months. Next, we follow and listen to the webinar lecture, which lasts 30 to 45 minutes. And finally, we will have Q&A session for approximately 15 minutes. PetroTeach is a global training solutions provider to the oil and gas industry. We are mainly focused on the upstream section by almost 150 training courses through 50 distinguished instruction instructors with ambition to expand to the downstream section. For more information, please visit our website www.petro-teach.com and download our catalog. You may also follow us in social media like LinkedIn and Facebook. The webinar today is part of the webinar series that PetroTeach will be offering during August 2020. And in going forward, we expect to have artificial leaf trends and considerations by Dr. Rajan Chokshi, uh, August 26. We had also gas hydrates theory and practice by Professor Bahman Tohidi and rock physics for quantitative reservoir characterization by Professor Tapan Mukherjee. This is a series of about 20 PetroTeach webinar, which will be presented in the rest of this year. And today's webinar is about petroleum economy a common subject in oil and gas industry, and the title of the presentation is Exploration, Valuation, and Decision Analysis. The material which will be covered today is related to Dr. Jafari Zadeh's experience during the last 15 years. So, we are pleased that Dr. Babak Jafari Zadeh can join us today. 
And you can see his work experience mainly as assistant professor in Heriot Watt University. He got PhD in petroleum investment and decision analysis from University of Stavanger. And also he worked as senior economic analyst in Equinur, former Statoil. He worked on energy projects from all the stages of value chain and in a variety of geographic areas, particularly on exploration activities in the Norwegian continental shelf. So this webinar is related to the class that Dr. Babak ran for PetroTeach on petroleum economy. We scheduled this online course to be held in September 7 to 9 and also November 23 to 25 and also available as in-house class. So if you are interested, please contact PetroTeach at information provided in the site. Okay, then I'm going to give the presenting rights over the Babak Jafarizadeh, and here you are. Go ahead, please, Babak. Thank you very much, Hassan. If you could give me the right, I can present here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Here you are. Amazing. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can see my screen here. Good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar on exploration, valuation, and decision analysis. As Hassan introduced me properly, thank you very much. My name is Babak, and I have been working as an assistant professor of petroleum economics at Harriet Watt University and have a range of experience on exploration valuation. So today we are going to discuss some of the aspects of valuation as they apply to exploration context. So we are going to introduce some of the analytical methods that are applied here. And uh, one of them is called decision trees. And it's a very convenient tool for modeling and also for communication of ideas. Um, something that I just wanted to start with is that we don't do valuations because they are fun or because we have to do them. We mainly do the valuations because we want to make decisions. So a good valuation model is a model that is helping us make decisions. So with this in mind, a valuation model should reflect the ensuing decisions and also the uncertainties. So we need to be able to describe the uncertainties and the decisions that we will make. So here, we are going to discuss these aspects, the decision analytic aspects of valuation. So what is exploration valuation? You know, exploration is like a gamble. We are betting on geology. So in this regard, exploration is very similar to the games of chance. You bet a sum of amount of money, on something that you don't know what the outcome would be, and then you wait for the outcome to show itself. Based on the outcome, you win or you lose. That's the simplest way to describe exploration. So in this regard, exploration is very similar to the games of chance. And if you think about it, drilling for oil and gas is like a multi-million dollar gamble we actually gamble the cost of drilling, which is usually in the order of 10 to $100 million. And that cost is our cost of entry. So we enter the gamble, and then we wait for the result of the exploration well to reveal itself. Well, if you look at history, most of the exploration wells didn't pay off. 
So only a few exploration wells ended in discoveries. Uh, to discuss this further, I thought we could take a look at the historical track record of exploration. How many wells have been drilled? How many of them ended up with discoveries? Things like this. Well, there are so many wells drilled around the world that we cannot actually get a clear picture of them. But at least we could take a look at the region. Here in this map, I'm showing the Norwegian continental shelf, the waters around the country of Norway, which are open to exploration. Here I'm showing the regions that historically have been the areas for exploration. You know that in the uh, oil and gas industry in Norway it started in the 1960s. It started actually with a well that was drilled in 1969 and it was a discovery. By the Christmas Eve of 1969, they knew that it is a large discovery and the name of that discovery is Ecofisk, which is, is a field that is still producing today. And by the end of the year 1969, Norway became an oil nation. So we have a track record of drilling for oil and gas in Norwegian continental shelf. And the track record is publicly available. The government of Norway is providing all the data freely available to the public. And here I have also a link to the place. If you go to www.npd.no, it's a government body, and they have a database of all the past drilling, of course, up to the past two years. So from two years ago, uh, the uh, information is not actually available. But for our purpose, it is ample information and it is very interesting. So some information about the Norwegian continental shelf is composed of three main areas. The North Sea, the Norwegian side of the North Sea, which is basically the North Sea is shared between the countries of Norway, the United Kingdom and Denmark. Uh, the Norwegian side is to the south. Then to the north of the North Sea is the Norwegian Sea and all the way to the north is the Barents Sea. There were in total almost 2,000 wells drilled. So up to the year 2018, two years ago, there were exactly 1,951 exploration wells drilled in this region. So all these wells, they were done for the purpose of exploration. But we need to know that not all of them were wildcat wells. Some of them were appraisal wells. So we could separate the wildcat wells and there were around well, 1,200, uh, 1,248 wildcat wells. Out of all these wells, there were 523 discoveries. So if you look at this picture, which is very overall and very general, you would say that almost 40% of the exploration wells ended up being discoveries, and the rest, around 60%, ended up being dry holes. So this confirms our initial idea that exploration, drilling for exploration, is basically a gamble. Here we can see that if you summarize this very holistic picture into simple terms, you would say that out of 10 wells that you drill, well, four of them would have been discoveries, six would have been dry holes. A dry hole means you find nothing and all the cost of drilling is down the drain. So you lose all the cost. But perhaps this is such a general picture. It doesn't show the specifics of exploration. We actually slice and dice the history into shorter periods. Perhaps we could take a look at the early years of exploration in the Norwegian continental shelf. In the first 20 years, almost 500 exploration wells were drilled. Out of these 500, there were around 300 wildcat wells. 
and only 96 discoveries. So in the early years, the success rate was lower. And perhaps I can understand it. Perhaps it's because uh, the geology was not known and the oil industry, exploration industry was at its infancy. I would expect the uh, result of exploration to improve over the years as the understanding improves and as the technology improves. And this actually confirms my guess. If you look at the recent 20 years, from the year 2000 to 2018, there were 800 wells drilled. Out of these 100, 560 wildcat wells and 272 discoveries. So you can see that the success rate in the past 20 years has actually improved. Almost 50% of the exploration wells uh, they ended up being discoveries. But perhaps we shouldn't congratulate ourselves yet. These are rates of successes. And we know that there is devil in the details. Uh, if we are thinking about exploration, exploration is done within companies that work for shareholders. So perhaps a mere exploration success is not important. Perhaps how much volume you discover, or even more importantly, how much recoverable volume you find. That's also another aspect. But if, again, if we take this rationale to extreme, the companies are not there to explore. They are not there to find oil or gas. Their purpose is to make money for the shareholders. They are businesses. So from that aspect, perhaps if you look at the first 20 years, most of the uh, value making and money making discoveries were in that period. The recent years, although the success rate in exploration has increased, the amount of value that is created is not comparable to the past. So in a way, we need some more sophistication in analysis of the past. This was just showing you how uncertain these type of investments are. There is uncertainty in the geology. We learn about geology. So as we learn, we reduce the uncertainty on the geological aspects. But there's also uncertainty on the technical aspects, how we can produce oil, and also uncertainty about the economics, what oil price there are, and how easy it is to produce it, and how costly it is to develop these fields. So as companies run businesses, their goal is to create shareholders' value. So in a way, we should make decisions that contribute to the goal of shareholder value creation. And this translates into making money grow or increasing the size of the company or perhaps increasing the stock prices of the company. But these are sort of complex goals. If we are thinking about making a decision in an exploration context, how should we make a decision? Should we make a decision based on success? Should we make a decision based on a technical success, or geological success, or amount of oil that is going to be produced, or some other measure? Here, I'm discussing that the measure of decision-making should be expected value. The value that we will get on average based on the uncertainties and the decisions that we make. So we can think of a project in a very simple way. We could think of them as gambles that have some costs and have some expected benefits. 
So if it was in a word that was um, that was certain, then it would have been easy decisions. Certain cost compared to certain benefits. Whenever the benefits outweigh the cost, then we are creating value. So that's a go decision. But in the real world, the costs are less known. The benefits are much less known. These are all uncertain. So the way to make decision, the measure still is the same, but instead of certain costs and certain benefits, we think about expected cost or expected benefits. So we can use this rationale and analyze the investment decisions in exploration. Something again that is about explorations is that they are, of course, large bets. Something else is that some of these bets, they actually end up opening doors to other bets. So let's look at a very simple bet. Let's look at drilling, and we are lucky enough to find oil or gas. So this is a scenario that we are discussing, a scenario that our drilling ends up having a discovery. But there's also another scenario that I can think of. That scenario, in that scenario, we, we lose our money. We end up with a dry hole. So we consider both of these possibilities. Of course, these are simplified possibilities. In practice, you may have a range of possibilities. But just to start simple, I would say that I can represent this investment decision with a decision tree. I would say that I have a decision to make, to drill or to walk away. If I walk away, the outcome is zero. But if I drill, then this circle node represents uncertainty. It's uncertain if we find oil or if we end up with a dry hole. Here, chance of success, COS, COS is the chance of success in drilling. And because we have only two possibilities, one minus chance of success is the chance of failure. So if I fail, then I pay the drilling cost. That's red, it means just it's negative. If I succeed, then I'll get a net reward. And that net reward is the subject of economic analysis. We need to do some economic analysis to know how much that reward is. So again, let's take a look at the scenario that we discover oil. So we could think of it in money terms. We could say that, well, on two dimensions, we have the horizontal dimension as time and the vertical dimension as amount of money that we receive or we pay. So right after the discovery, we have to pay more of development cost. You know, oil is there in the subsurface, but it's not readily available. We have to develop the field to make it available and produce it and send it to the market. So this means that for a few years sometimes, sometimes for a decade, we will have negative cash flows. Then after these time of preparation and construction and development, we will get a production profile. It will start, it will accelerate up, it will reach a peak and it will gradually decline. That's the pattern that we observe in many of the conventional oil or gas uh, fields. So we produce oil and we sell oil or gas in the markets and we get this revenue. The revenue is just production times expected prices. So here I'm showing the expected prices. In order to operate this asset, we need to pay operating costs called OPEX. And we also need to pay taxes to the government, pay variable costs and things like that. So this is a simplified picture of all the cash flows that we will get if we make a discovery. But then we only need one number. What is the value of all this? We simplify this again 
into one number called the NPV. And the NPV or net present value is the sum of all the discounted cash flows. You get the cash flows in each year, we subtract the negative cash flows from the positive ones, and then we get this net cash flow and we discount them for the year that they account. The result is one number. Here I'm showing it with a red circle. And that one number represents the, the holistic picture of this cash flow. And I can use it in my decision tree. So you can see that I have introduced a lot of simplifications into my analysis. The simplifications are in a way necessary because otherwise the details would have drowned me. I have to make some simplifications, but I, I still need to reflect the key aspects of valuation. So many companies discuss value versus value. And I thought we could address it here. Many companies look for value and they say that more volume is better. Here is an example. We have two different production profiles that result in exactly the same amount of oil. So the area under the curves represents the cumulative ultimate recovery. So the amount of oil that is produced in these two instances is exactly the same. But if we assume the prices are constant, these two production profiles, they represent actually two different values. The production profile on the left has everything else being the same. The one on the left has less of value compared to the one on the right. Why? Because on the right hand side, we do something called accelerated production. If we could do accelerated production because of the time value of money, the value would be higher. So in a way, the discussion between value versus volume is sort of a discussion that always fails. The companies basically create, they want to create value for the shareholders and their decisions should be based on value, not volume. So I thought I could also in the remaining time, uh, we could discuss some of the other aspects of uh, big bets in the industry. And as I said, the bets are uncertain. Sometimes they also open doors to other bets. And here we can discuss one example that a bet, an exploration bet, opens doors, open the door to other bets. Let's assume that we have a common area and we have identified two exploration targets. Just to make life easy for you, I have already calculated the elements that we need to include in the decision tree. So for prospect alpha in the top, we have the NPV of success, the cost of drilling, $35 million and a chance of success, 35%. For prospect beta, we have also the NPV of success, 15 million, cost of drilling, 20 million, and the chance of success is almost half, 49%. So using the analysis that we discussed earlier, I could put these numbers into a decision tree and I could calculate the expected value coming from these prospects. Then I can decide if I should drill them or not. So for prospect alpha, I have a decision to make to drill or to walk away. If I drill with 35% chance, I will get an NPV of 60 million. And with 65% chance, I will end up paying the cost of drilling. For prospect beta, similar story i drill or walk away if i drill then there's uncertainty with 49 percent chance i will get the reward of 15 million dollars with 51 51 percent chance i will end up paying the it's a dry hole 
and I will end up paying $20 million cost of drilling. So with this description, should I drill them or not drill them? I can calculate the expected value for each course of action. The, the value for walking away is simple. You spend nothing and you gain nothing. For drilling is the expected value that we discussed. So probabilities multiplied by the outcomes. The expected values for drilling prospect alpha is minus $2 million and for prospect beta is minus $3 million. What does this say? This says that on average, drilling each of these prospects is not a good idea. We will end up losing money on average on the expected terms. So the recommendation is to walk away. Zero is more than a negative number. So the recommendation is to walk away from these prospects. But then we discuss this with the geologists and they say that, yes, of course, you included the information about the success or failure in these prospects. But they are in a common area and they share some geological factors. So the geologists start to discuss that, well, for oil or gas to be present, you need to have a cap rock, a seal, reservoir rock, and some hydrocarbon charge so that you have a discovery. If you drill one of these targets and you find that it contains oil, then the chance of success in the nearby targets increases. If you drill one of them and you find that it doesn't contain oil, perhaps because the reservoir rock is missing or there's no charge, there's no hydrocarbon charge, then your estimate for the chance of success in the nearby prospect also decreases. And the geologists say that, well, you didn't show these informational relationships in your analysis. I would ask, how do you explain, how do you reflect these information analysis, these relationships between these two um, prospects? And they say, well, we can show you the joint probabilities for these events. So here in this table, I have received joint probabilities from the geologist. Here, for example, the probability of both prospects being su successful, drilling both prospects successfully is about 23%. The probability of dry hole in alpha and success in beta is 26% and so on. So how can I include these joint probabilities into my analysis? The analysis would have been a bit more complex, but nevertheless, I can include them. I can actually calculate the conditional probability for each outcome given the other outcome. And I can do it like this. I would build a larger decision tree by saying that in the beginning, I have three alternatives. I could drill alpha, I could drill beta, or I could walk away. If I walk away, I have spent nothing and I gain nothing. So this is it. If I drill alpha, then there is this chance. Similarly, if I drill beta, there is this original chance of success. So these chances of success are same as before. But then, based on the outcome of the first row, then there is this updated understanding about drilling the second row. So I will have another set of decisions to drill or walk away the other row given the result of the first well. And the chance of success in the second well would have been conditional on the outcome of the first well. So I could show them here with all the end nodes and the probabilities that you can see here, they are calculated from the joint probabilities that are earlier I got it from the geologist. 
So you might ask, where did these probabilities come from? I have used the Bayes theorem. And based on that, I have calculated these conditional probabilities. So if I solve this decision tree, the course of action that follows this drill beta, if it is successful, then drill alpha. If it's dry, then drop. If I follow this strategy, the expected value becomes positive. It's positive $2 million. So what happened here? We started with two prospects. We had negative expected value if we didn't consider the informational relationship between these two prospects. Then we considered these probabilities, joint probabilities, which represent the informational relationship between them. And adding information actually increased our assessment of value. So two wells that with simplistic analysis were unreliable. Now, if you consider them in a more sophisticated analysis, the recommendation is to drill. So this is what I mean by a bet that opens the door to other bets. So if we follow this strategy, drill alpha, sorry, it was drill beta, and if it's successful, drill alpha. If it's dry hold, then stop. I have a time for you. Sorry about that. So this could be extended. We had a sophisticated model and that accommodated a problem cons consisting of two wells. But we could think of also extensions to more wells. Perhaps if we could consider a common area, originally we had alpha and beta and a geological correlation between them. We could imagine that in this area, we have identified other drilling candidates, so other prospects. And if we have five drilling candidates, the number of correlation increases to pairwise correlations increases to 10. But the number of conditional probabilities, pairwise conditional probabilities, or overall all the conditional probabilities, it will actually increase to hundreds. And including hundreds of conditional probabilities into larger decision trees is perhaps um, unpractical. So the solution to problems like this is to use dynamic programming, which we do not discuss today. And I just wanted to show you that there are solutions for these things. Another extension of this model would have been to consider oil price uncertainty. And what I mean by oil price uncertainty is that, well, Let's assume we have all our prospects, five drilling candidates here, and we consider drilling them. Also, please mention that, well, there are time required to drill the well, perhaps a few months, and there's also some time required to interpret the results, perhaps a few more months. And if we consider that in a temporal basis, in the beginning, we have five drilling candidates to drill. And we could think of it in the time dimension that we first, in the first period, we determine the first well. Then on the second period, we have four drilling candidates to make a decision about. We identify the best course of action. And then on the third period, we have three alternatives and so on. So we continue to determine the best course of action as we move on into this project. But then we also know, need to know that during these times, the oil prices changed and the economics of these exploration wells of course, are very sensitive to the oil prices. So if we are thinking of, in practice, five drilling candidates, 
and usually a few months required to drill a well and a few months to, required to, to interpret the results. The wells would have been drilled almost one year apart. So for a five year campaign, we are looking at five, uh, for five uh, wells, we are looking at five, a five year campaign. And uh, during five years, we will have lots of fluctuations in oil prices and the oil prices will affect the economics or the decisions of these wells. Well, these are some extensions that I just wanted to uh, tell you about, and we discuss them in more detail within the course. So perhaps we could stop here, and if you have any questions, please use the chat section and ask me any questions, or I think because we are not that many, you could open the mic and you could ask your questions. Just wanted to let you know that there is a online course discussing more aspects of analysis and exploration that uh, we are running in uh, September, also in November. So back to you, Hassan. If you have any question yourself or if you have received questions from others, I'll be happy to answer them. Great. Thank you very much, Bobak, for the nice presentation. So You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's start the Q and A session. But before that, I wanted to remind one more time that uh, you can ask your questions from uh, Bobak by using the question feature on the webinar dashboard. If you have question like to ask him, and after two days webinar, you will receive a link to the recorded webinar if you want to share it with your colleagues. So, is there any question from the audience? So perhaps I myself, I can answer a common question that usually appears when I present these uh, topics so that others can okay. think of other question. So one question that is usually coming is that how do the oil prices affect the economics of exploration wells? Uh, the answer is not that easy. But if you look at the past track record of the industry, whenever oil prices are down, the exploration activities go down. So during oil price downturns, we have much less expression activity compared to the times that oil prices are high. But when you do exploration, it takes many years to develop. It takes many other years to produce from that development. So oil prices right now do not have any effect on the outcome of exploration though. But then it's a dilemma. Why do the investors react to oil prices now? The answer is that today's oil prices, they also reflect an outlook of the future. And if you have low oil prices now, it just reflects an outlook of low oil prices in the future, or that's how the market is seeing it. And if you are thinking in that in those terms, then lower prices now leading to lower prices in the future, then exploration is not good, so you stop drilling. That's that's usually the uh, thought process that comes out of relationship between oil prices now and oil price and exploration activities. Thank you very much, Bobak. I also unmuted all participants, uh, so you can uh, mute yourself also. You can ask your question by yourself. But uh, I have a question myself, Bobak. Uh, what is the normal NPV, uh, average NPV for the offshore Norway? Of, of course, it depends on many parameters. It depends on the uh, oil in place and uh, other parameters, but the, in average, what is the NPV for offshore Norway? 
Yes, so you answered your question. That's a very good question, but the answer is actually within the question. It depends, yes. really, really depends. Uh, so if you look at NPV, it's a, a combination of many things. The elements are costs, prices, and the volume of production. So these are the simple elements that go into NPV. And any of these things could vary. So more than everything else uh, is how much you discover and what oil prices are. Because cost of development across the Norwegian continental shelf, well, it depends on also the, the water depth and all the other factors. But in a specific region with same water depth and same similarities, uh, you would end up having similar cost levels. So it all goes down into how much you can produce and how, how the oil, where, how, what the level the oil prices are. Mm -hmm. Having said that, in the past, the Norwegian continental shelf was considered the dry hole capital of the world, mainly because there were no discoveries, no worthwhile discoveries. So what do I mean by worthwhile? We had technical discoveries, which from the geological point of view, they are appealing, but from the value point of view, they were unappealing. The cost of development and production was more than the value of the revenues. So this would make their NPVs negative. So just a simple answer to your question is that it depends on many factors and without a consistent analysis of these factors, we would never know what the NPV is. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any question from uh, audience? Thanks for the participation. What do you prefer? Uh, one of the question from audience is that uh, uh, she says, thank, thanks for the pre presentation. What do you prefer these days? EOR slash IOR method for development or exploration new field? Well, um, these are, but the preference is a, Tricky word. I cannot prefer something, you know, that's the shareholders of a company that prefer, and they prefer more money to less money. That's what I know. So to for development, uh, then uh, any project that creates money would be a preferable project. But you are in a way, this question is has some truth in it. it. It has, what do we do to create money? There are different uh, avenues to create value in the oil and gas industry. One avenue would be to use the best of the existing resources. Like as in this question, she's saying IOR or EOR methods. We make the best use of the existing resources. The other avenue would be to discover new resources, and that's exploration. So there are two avenues, and these do not need to be competing with each other. They are two, both of them, on their own rights. Without exploration, we will not find new resources, and we will not be able to replace the depleted resources that we have. Also, without EOR and IOR, we will not be able to make the best of our existing resources. So in my mind, they are complementary. They are not competing with each other. And they are both ways to create shareholder value. I hope I answered your question. Yes, any other questions? Uh, nope. Okay, thanks again, Dr. Babak, and uh, thanks everybody.
and uh, hope to see you all in the uh, in our next webinars thank you bye bye thank you very much i appreciate your attention have a nice day bye 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 bye